So I uh, want to stress here that this is uh, really quantum likeness. I'm absolutely telling you from the outset that I'm absolutely not pretending there's anything quantum mechanical going on in economics or finance. Um, and that's why I just use this qualifier likeness. <coughs> this is the outline of the talk. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, some, some, some history to position uh, where this, this movement in economics and finance is, is, uh, is going. Um, I'll talk a little bit about metaphors also because uh, I'm, uh, I'm aware that we are using models and, and models and metaphors may, may, may have a connection. Um, then I'll briefly uh, discuss some of the research in this uh, of quantum-like research in economics and finance. And then I'll uh, give you three uh, applications where we uh, can use some of the ideas, especially at the level of semi-classical uh, equations uh, in the environment here. This is the Bellman equation for evaluation problem. Uh, in information equations, which are useful, I think, in economics, this is, uh, I think, quite interesting uh, development. And then also in uh, the relationship between the, the, the physical concept of action and uh, excess returns. And then also a conclusion. Uh, Fifteen years ago, or maybe more, I don't know, um, there was some work which was started in the area of using quantum mechanics in macroscopic environments. And I'm particularly thinking about a paper which was written by uh, the uh, Segal and Segal people. One of them was the MIT uh, mathematician, the other one I don't know to which department he belonged, on um, reformulating uh, Black Scholes option pricing theory within a quantum environment. And I think it was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the US. Uh, I'm not sure whether this paper ever had any great impact on the finance community. I don't think it actually had. It's a very difficult paper to understand. And I'm, I'm, I'm unsure still at this stage whether really uh, it brings in uh, a lot of new uh, uh, elements. But I mean, let me take that as a starting point where, where some of this work uh, uh, um, was, was beginning. Um, this movement, since about 15 years now, has uh, gathered some momentum uh, and it's getting many more followers. Um, you know much better than I do that uh, in a lot of what we do, there are a lot of new movements. Yeah? So in economics and in, in, in academics, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about two, two movements I've been associated with at some point. Uh, an example was Fuzzy Set Theory. Uh, which actually started in California, apparently, uh, out of a, a duel between um, uh, Lotfi Zadeh and Rudolf Kalman, and had an enormous following in the 90s. Because I think if, I, I, I think if you're going to ask me when the Zadeh paper was published, I think it was somewhere, was it in the 70s? Or, but, but really, this movement started really taking on steam, uh, really, I think, in the early 90s. And it was uh, led by this French duo, Dubois and Prat, who published an enormous amount of papers in the area. There was even a, a, a journal, which still exists, called Fuzzy Sets and, Fuzzy Sets and Systems, I think. Um, and, and it was really something which uh, was, was very promising in the 90s. Um, I don't know if Professor Machina is here. No, he's not. Professor Machina may have known about that when he was participating in the Foundations of Utility and Risk Conferences uh, series. There were, I, I think, I, I may be mistaken, but there were some special sessions, I think, on fuzzy set theory and their applicability, uh, their applications in, in utility theory and, and in economics uh, in, a, in a wider sense. Um, <coughs> uh, so, what we see now, on what, 2013, I mean, some fuzzy people may not be agreeing with that, but I think nowadays, I think fuzzy sets has, has, is, is, I think, uh, close to being <laughs> uh, defunct, I think. And the question also you may ask here is whether this actually, this, this phenomenal movement in the 90s, actually, whether it actually contributed to economics and finance. And I think the answer there is probably uh, no. So here we have an example of a movement which was really exploded, had a lot of followers, uh, probably didn't really contribute to economics and finance as such, and now is close to be uh, phased out. Now, another movement which uh, I've been involved in a little bit is, uh, you may have heard about that movement, it's called the Econophysics Movement, um, and which is basically run by 
uh, Professor Stanley from Boston University, which has as main aim to uh, basically apply statistical mechanics techniques uh, to finance and economics. This is a movement uh, which has, uh, well, it's a bit difficult to know what the real starting papers are, but it, 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 it certainly is not at the level where it's phased out. I mean, it's still very, very important and very strong. But you may wonder, uh, although uh, those uh, people in the econophysics community have contributed massively in understanding, for instance, how phase transitions uh, can be seen in economics, how uh, power laws can be uncovered in economics, um, wh what I think the movement has not done is actually come forward with uh, new models in economics as such. And I think that's a little bit uh, the problem with, with um, uh, um, this uh, movement. Um, <coughs> it's obviously far too new, uh, quantum mechanics uh, and its application uh, to macroscopic uh, systems, to uh, write a history uh, about it. But we, I think, share at least one problem with the both two movements, not that we are going to go to defunct stages, I hope not, uh, but it's, we have definitely a labeling problem, I think. Uh, I remember in the 90s when, you know, I was a graduate student, um, uh, people in my department would say, fuzzy Matt, what is this? I mean, what, what, I mean you, you're kind of almost shooting yourself in the foot here by the, by the label you're using, actually. Particularly when they had uh, articles on fuzzy logic. Exactly, right, <laughs> exactly. So that, that was really uh, quite problematic. And I think to some extent, I think the problem applies also here on uh, quantum mechanics and microscopic uh, systems. You have to, I think, be very careful uh, on how you uh, label it. Um, <coughs> uh, some of the uh, research in, in the area of quantum thinking uh, actively uh, uses quantum mechanics. And I think we've seen examples yesterday with the talk by uh, Jerome and, and Joyce and, and uh, um, Jennifer, that there seems to be a quite close connection between with the ideas of quantum mechanics and, 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 uh, and uh, psychology. But there's a lot of work out there where that connection is much less tight and much more open uh, for discussion. And actually yesterday, right, it was quite clear there was still a lot of question marks too. But now if, if the connection uh, between using such a remotely uh, such a remotely, I mean, you know, quantum mechanics is working on a very different scale. And if you present those things to physics communities, of course, they will point that out all the time. It's an obvious thing. Um, and, and especially if the connection is not very tight, then you open yourself up to things like this. Eh? When, when someone, I don't know when he said that, but uh, one of the things he did say was that it was nothing more pathetic than to have an economist or a retired engineer try to force analogies between the concept of physics and the concepts of engineers. And of course, you open yourself up for those kind of critiques when certainly the uh, connection is, is, is not uh, very tight. Now, I, I would wonder that if uh, he was making uh, that comment, uh, whether he actually was thinking about uh, a metaphorical use of, of physics, for instance, in, in social science. I, I presume he, he was thinking of that. But then my question to you is, is metaphorical use something which is in fact non-kosher? Um, I mean, if, if we follow uh, this thought that uh, by, by uh, this gentleman here, that models could be made to be functions of metaphors and quantitative and, and qualitative bits, then basically uh, we're not that far away uh, from what we are doing. Um, <coughs> now, this may not always work, uh, right? There are areas, for instance, in maths. Uh, apparently, uh, there's a very nice quote here from Edward Nelson from, from Mats at Princeton, who says that in the formalism approach to mathematics, what is real is notation, not imagined denotation. So if denotation would be akin to uh, metaphorical views, then indeed in that formalistic approach to mathematics, you would never have models if you follow this type of definition. <coughs> um, <coughs> right. Now, the title of this talk is Quantum Life Research in Economics and Finance. And I really want to point out again that quantum life for me means really bluntly this, trying to use some of the uh, formalism of quantum mechanics in social science and see how you can get mileage out of that use. That's bluntly what it is. So again, I to say that very clearly. I'm not saying here that by using such a toolkit that we're proving that anything quantum mechanical really as such is going on. 
Um, <coughs> there is early work on the link between uh, quantum mechanics and, and social science in this paper by in, in 1999 by Andre uh, Krennikov, which appeared in a physics journal here, this wait, on, on here, Foundations of Physics. And there's some other work, uh, I don't know, I mean, my question here is, 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 this, is this quantum-like work? I don't know. This is the, one of the starting papers, the Segal and Segal paper in 98. Um, there's some other work here by Martin Schubeck. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Brandenburger was not here, but this is much more a physics paper, but he has also uh, a nice paper on what he calls quantum decision theory, uh, which I think you can download from his website. Uh, and there's other work by uh, this gentleman here, Bilal Baki, on using path integration in uh, finance. And uh, uh, of course, a lot of work by Jérôme uh, uh, Busemeyer and, and books which have now appeared uh, with, with especially Cambridge University Press. Um, Busemeyer and Brusa have work. Uh, Baki has uh, work. Uh, myself and then also uh, Fabio Bagarello with uh, with John Wiley. <coughs> and there's also research funding. I mean, as you saw yesterday, uh, my got uh, research, from, uh, research funding from the NSF. We got money uh, a while ago uh, with Bardou, who unfortunately died. Uh, he was only 41 years of age. And uh, uh, Dirk Aert from the University of Brussels and also from the ESRC, which is the um, um, Economics and Science, uh, Social Science Research Council of the UK, although that's not really on, on quantum mechanics. And there's also some quite uh, well-known conferences on, 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 on the foundations of quantum mechanics, and, and they have hosted some talks on the applicability of quantum mechanics in, in macroscopic systems, uh, hosted by especially, this founded by, especially by Andrei Krenikov. He has the longest series on that. Of course, you have been so kind to invite me here. And then um, there's also a quantum interaction conference, which uh, will happen at my university this year at the end of July. And I'll give you some of the information at the end of the talk. What I want to do now is uh, actually try to uh, give you a flavor of what I think uh, we can do with some of uh, um, the uh, elements of quantum mechanics in, in uh, finance and economics. And I'll just start out with uh, uh, something some of us uh, may well know, and that's the Bellman equation, which is a, a very, ev every graduate student in macroeconomics, for instance, will know about the Bellman equation. This is a, um, an equation which is very important uh, in control theory, and it forms part of dynamic programming and is used heavily in, in uh, macroeconomic dynamics. Um, <coughs> now, um, I'm assuming here, and I'll just present some very simple model. I don't think that the object uh, of this talk is really to discuss this model. I just want to make a connection between the setup of this Bauman equation and uh, what we call semi-classical equations uh, in physics. Um, so the model is very simple. We have an asset A and we have a valuation of this asset A and we compare this valuation of that asset A with the prices of this asset A. And we are assuming that um, uh, the uh, price uh, of the uh, asset A, this is PA here, follows a geometric band in motion, and we're assuming that uh, uh, there is a density function on uh, that price. So here you have it. So we just have this the infinite number change in the price, which is uh, given by a drift rate and expected return mu. Right? This is the time parameter. Here is the volatility, and this is the Wiener process. <coughs> So we're assuming that uh, there is some sort of utility or some level of satisfaction which sits on this relationship between the valuation of the asset and the price of the asset. And at the same time, if there's a sort of utility which sits on this, there is also this utility which is attached to setting up the valuation. And we're assuming here that the valuation, uh, that, that that is a function also of the level of the expected uh, return mu. So we're defining uh, the utility function as a function this of the, the density function on P. We're not saying what this utility function is. And um, we're having a disutility, which I call a disutility or a cost, uh, which emerges in having to estimate that consensus valuation. You can then uh, formulate this problem as uh, a Bellman function U. Right? So at each time T, you have to maximize the distance between the, the satisfaction of setting, uh, of looking at the, the relationship of the valuation vis-a-vis -vis the asset 
and setting up the valuation. And you discount it at a certain discount factor lambda and you integrate uh, to its time. So that's kind of what you would have. So this UPT would be a Bellman function. But this UPT also has actually a physical interpretation too. And that's what I think is interesting. So if you look, and I, all the references uh, of, of this presentation are at the end. So I will put up this presentation on the website if you, if you agree with that. Um, there's a very nice paper by jean Tron and Le Paul and Guillaume uh, who propose virtually the same equation here in a different context, in population context. And uh, they mention in their paper uh, that uh, work by uh, Lyon and Lafri, uh, two papers here, 2006 and 2006 star, find that the uh, associated PDEs to this Bellman equation contain some very interesting terms. So this term here actually has actually the uh, interpretation of an action term. And those actions, so you have a look at this U here, this, way, this one here. Right, and it has some interesting uh, interpretations in two equations. I'm not going to mention yet what those equations are here. So you have a partial derivative on time here towards the price. And this is your discount rate. And if you look at this one here, here you have your time, de your, your time dependent density function and then uh, a partial derivative of B on this product. It turns out actually that those terms actually are part and parcel of uh, a set of uh, equations. They're called semi-classical equations. They actually have even a more fancier name. Um, they are called uh, Madelung equations. And Madelung um, is quite famous, I think. I'm not sure how physicists, if how many physicists actually know him. But he actually gave a sort of what is called the hydrodynamic interpretation of quantum mechanics, which actually is very close to a sort of semi-classical interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it happens to be actually also very close to uh, to uh, Bohm uh, the Bray to the Bohm uh, the Bray framework. Which, if you've ever heard about the Bohm the Bray framework, basically what it says is that um, we can uh, interpret uh, quantum mechanics. It's, it's I have to be careful what I say here. I mean, in in Bohm the Bray you can have parts. Uh, in ordinary quantum mechanics you can't. Um, those modeling equations are very, very close to that uh, type of Bohm and the Bray uh, framework. And you can see it very quickly. I didn't want to go to all the equations, but you can see it very quickly because one of the equations, right, there are two sets of equations. One is a hamilton jacobi equation. The other one is a continuity equation. One of them contains an extra term next to the, the real potential, which is in Bohm and the Bray called uh, the quantum potential. So, okay, my message here at this point is just only saying this, that the Bellman function, right, in this framework here, is actually an action term in uh, those modeling equations. And that's something which I'm not saying, but this is uh, very clearly ex explained here by Lyon and Nasri, and I think we are in good company with, uh, right, uh, Pierre-Louis Lyon is quite uh, a serious person, so I don't think uh, I'm too worried about whether this is uh, wrong. Um, <coughs> so those three terms here uh, are part of this hamilton jacobi equation. The, the, those two terms are part of the uh, continuity equation. Right, so... <coughs> um, right. Now, this relationship between what I was mentioning, hydrodynamics and quantum mechanics, this dates from the work by Marlum. And I want to say a little bit more about this because I have already quoted Nelson at the beginning of the talk. Actually, I want to quote him again here. There's a very beautiful paper by Nelson, which was written in the 60s, on um, uh, introducing a sort of calculus, which is based on mean forward and mean backward derivatives. And by doing that type of calculus, actually, he gets to those same type of equations, this hamilton jacobi equation with this term next to the real potential, and uh, the continuity equation, which uh, for for our purposes is quite useful. I have asked uh, Prof. Nelson about the applicability of this in macroscopic systems, and he thought that, in fact, it was not so applicable at all, actually. But uh, he has confirmed uh, to be one of the keynote speakers at the conference I organized in Leicester now at the end of July. So, of course, we'll be able to ask him again uh, at that time. This is very interesting here to look uh, at this quote by uh, Elbaz. 
In Nelson's stochastic mechanics, particles retain their corpuscular ca character with the probability of observing any property is wave mechanical. This interpretation separates the corpuscular aspects from the wave mechanical aspects that exist uh, side by side in the De Bray's interpretation. So what you have basically in the De Bray interpretation is really like we would have in classical mechanics, we would have right, the gradient of the real potential or the negative of the gradient of the, of the real potential, which is the force, which would be the mass times acceleration. In the De Bray framework or the Bohm De Bray framework, you're going to have that that relationship is equal to the, the, the negative gradient of the sum of two potentials, the real potential and the quantum potential. And now you're going to say, the next thing you're going to say, but what the heck do you want to do with this quantum potential? Well, it, has, it turns out that actually this quantum potential, if you look at the real, at, at, the, f at the gradient on, on, on that potential, it turns out that you can actually do something with it uh, within um, economics, I think. Uh, and I have one or two papers on this uh, uh, where, where you could, I think, argue that that type of potential can be used to develop a pricing rule. Um, <coughs> right. <coughs> Let me, okay, so, so let's keep in mind this mo those modeling equations, those, those are semi-classical PDEs, there's the kind of twilight type of equations, they're not really quantum mechanical, you can do something with it, but it sits in between classical and quantum mechanics, that's, that's kind of how I would like to think of it. There's another, another example here on how you can use these equations, which I think is a very neat uh, example, also which, which has some connection with, with economics. This is recent work by Hawkins, Aoki, oh, Aoki, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is an economist at UCLA, I think, um, and Frieden, and also Hawkins and Frieden, and I've done some work on this uh, myself also. And here, uh, this, the, the setup of, of uh, is, is quite simple. I mean, you look at the price, an observed price, you look at fluctuations on that price, and uh, they define here in their paper um, uh, a type of information measure, uh, which is actually called fish information, and uh, which tells you that the information contained on a small variation should actually be higher than uh, the information contained on a large variation. Um, and here is the ID, right? So basically, uh, the information is very, very high when the uh, density function is very, very tight. Um, and that's uh, the idea of this Fisher information. Now what is very neat here is that this Fisher information can be compared with another type of information which is called uh, this one here, intrinsic information, which is perfectly knowable collection of information. So if you compare that type of information with this type of information, then you have a measure of what we could call uh, asymmetric uh, information. But it turns out that this difference between intrinsic information, uh, sorry, uh, fish information and intrinsic information actually is a Lagrangian. And it turns out actually that if you vary that Lagrangian towards action and towards the density, then actually you end up again with those modeling equations. So you have a very, it can be shown that there's a very, very close connection if you set it up in a finance environment that you have a very close connection between what we have set up here in the finance environment and those modeling equations which come out of this variation of this Lagrangian. Now, this variation of this Lagrangian to get to the modeling equations is not something which was actually proposed by Ho uh, Hawkins and Frieden. It was actually proposed in a very nice paper by <coughs> Regina Tu in 1998. Uh, very, very nice <coughs> uh, paper. And I will also give you the reference <coughs> at the end. <coughs> And I, oh yeah, I must also mention that in their work, actually those equations 100% are, are exactly the same equations as you would get in Marvel. That's not the same with the, with, the, with the Bellman approach. There are some extra terms in the Bellman approach. This one here is 100% coinciding with uh, the Bohm Bray theory. Now, so we looked so far at action in terms of the Bellman function. Uh, we looked also at action in relation to infor information asymmetry. Uh, there's another way to look at action, and that's in the case of uh, work which was proposed by uh, Kerry Lelinsky in 2001, where he looks at, uh, I have to be a bit careful about that, but more where he looks at, at, at excess returns on assets in terms of curvature of manifolds. 
specifically in the context of so-called fiber bundles. And I don't want to talk about fiber bundles in this, in this talk here, but I want to give you a flavor of how this uh, arbitrage excess return can actually be formulated in terms of an action uh, functional. Um, <coughs> very simple example. You can put cash in the bank, right? And get a return, say for instance risk-free in this case, right? Because I mean, I assume that I can get this out of the bank without any trouble, the bank is not going to default. And I can get it out at the bank at, say, a future time, withdraw it and buy shares uh, which are of that uh, level at time uh, i plus one. So what do I get? Uh, so you get those amount of shares, so that's your return on your cash, and that's the price uh, of a share at time t i plus one. You can do that, but you can also compare with the other situation where instead of uh, having cash and putting it uh, in the bank, you buy the shares at time t1 and uh, you let them go until time ti plus 1 and you get a return on them. So basically you get, get the situation here where this is the return and you buy them at time uh, uh, t1. Now what could be interesting here is that you may want to compare this quantity with uh, that quantity um, and what if they're not the same? If they're not the same, you could say, well, there's a buying opportunity. <coughs> you could call this an arbitrage excess return. You have to be a bit, a bit careful with the use of that word. <coughs> because basically, what you would have actually to do is uh, to assign a risk-free return on, on, on the risky asset it's if you want to do that. Is, okay. is, the price of the share <coughs> is the price of the share in period T plus 1 known to the investor in period no, T? No, no. So you have to run up to T plus 1 and then go backwards, that's right. and that, that's how you would arbitrage. Yeah. You need a yeah. time machine. That's right. Yeah. Those are easy to come by. <coughs> they're, they're easy to come by. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, no way. <laughs> so if, if, if we look at this relationship, <coughs> right, either like this or like that, then we can uh, get those relationships here, that one there, or that one there. And of course, what we can then do is just add them up and look at this relationship here. Now this relationship here, if you look in, in, in the book by Linsky, actually uh, co corresponds to a curvature on a manifold. But what is very interesting also is that actually this relationship here could actually be written as an action <coughs> term or an action functional on stock and return, this whole thing here. So basically this action, you could say under no, uh, the assumption of no arbitrage would actually be zero. And what is interesting here, I think, is that you can then relate um, this action by definition, this action will also sit in a probability measure. Let me just see. Okay, you can do it in continuous time too, but that's not too interesting. Oh, no, sorry. It's right here. Sorry. Right? In this case here. So what you can have then in this situation is that under no arbitrage, actually, you can link that up with a measure of uh, risk uh, neutral probabilities. And there is some mileage there, I think, uh, and I'm developing a paper which I submitted recently uh, on this. <coughs> Okay, now uh, let me just come quickly to a conclusion and then we can uh, discuss a little bit more if you're interested. Uh, the Hawkins and Frieden argument in, uh, says the following, and I think I agree with that, although a lot of my colleagues in finance department will not so much agree, but anyhow. Uh, they say that <coughs> financial economics and statistical mechanics work on a common front, and what has been that common front? Well, it has been the language of stochastic dynamics. And uh, as I said, I mean, a lot of my colleagues won't agree with that because uh, they think they have developed it all themselves, and I don't think that's really the case. I mean, we've been borrowing brown emotions, stochastic calculus, really, from another area, I think. <coughs> now, of course, you can say the same thing uh, between <laughs> financial economics and quantum mechanics, obviously, for things like this one here. Now, you're going to say, well, <coughs> in, in this talk, we've basically looked at, at a connection between Berman's approach, for instance, and the action functional. We've looked at varying uh, the difference between two levels of information um, and again uh, those modeling equations and this curvature approach but you're going to say well the next thing I, I'm sure the, the, the thing you're thinking is all of those above approaches bluntly speaking use those quantum mechanical tools they do not claim anything about quantum mechanics uh, that quantum mechanical stuff is happening in financial process but why do we have to, do we bother um, using those things in finance because certainly I haven't convinced you about that now, I think uh, my answer here is basically threefold. Uh, the first reason here, I think, is 
and <coughs> I gladly send you some of the papers, I think by using the semi-classical approach um, and, and having access to those terms like real potential, like quantum potential, and being able to give a financial interpretation to those, I think there is some mileage you can get out of this. Uh, unfortunately, what we have seen historically is that although some people, like for instance, I can mention Thomas Lux, for instance, had a very nice paper in the 90s, um, uh, let me think, uh, 91 or 92, which appeared in the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, where he actually showed very, very nicely how uh, traders uh, can be modeled with the use of, of, of real potential functions. Unfortunately, that work has not really trickled down into uh, the economics uh, mainstream. I don't know what the reasons are for that. But uh, I think with the use of those semi-classical equations, there is really this other dimension of using uh, information via the wave function and translate that, you can translate that via this use of this additional term next to the real potential, which is this kind of, between quotes, uh, quantum potential. So I think there's something to do there. Um, <coughs> Reason two, I think if we have talked, if we have looked at the talks by uh, Jerome yesterday uh, on um, uh, this, um, uh, looking at uh, decision making, um, well, hold on, uh, yeah, let me just go to this reason here. I mean, maybe I want to discuss that one first. Um, the second reason here, I I'll come to the third reason, but the second reason here is maybe, it's, that one is more checkered though. Um, there may be some interesting avenues to look for quantum mechanical characteristics in finance via apparently uh, the fact that, uh, for instance, in option pricing theory, the Hamiltonians seem to be um, non-hermission. But apparently from the moment that you introduce an arbitrage possibility, they, they actually can be hermission. So I think there may be some mileage out of, of this uh, approach. <coughs> I happen uh, to know the gentleman who actually came up with the argument, and we're working on this right now. I'm not sure uh, where it's going, though, but uh, there may be some, some interesting um, work coming out of that. But it is really, it seems to be, it's very interesting. I mean, I find that in economics and finance, when you want to connect it with some concept in quantum mechanics really sometimes very often it has to do with introducing arbitrage. Uh, it's very strange. The third reason here, of course, why we want to do that is uh, to come to what I actually wanted to say uh, from what Jerome and uh, Joyce and uh, Jennifer were doing yesterday, that if decision making may have quantum mechanical features as they have tried to show yesterday, then I think it may not be a big step to argue that such feature will, features will affect economic and financial modeling. Uh, in, in the end. But of course, we'll be dependent on, on their good work, you see, so that's, uh, that's a problem. Um, <coughs> I just want to uh, stop here and then uh, open the floor for questions. I just want to say that if you're interested, you're most welcome uh, to come to this conference here, which is the seventh uh, version of the Quantum Interaction Conference, uh, which happens <coughs> at my university at the end of July. And we have some very nice keynote speakers, especially this Prof. Nelson here from Princeton who's going to come, and then also Prof. Abramsky, who is a computer scientist, and uh, Prof. Galam from Ecole um, Polytechnique. And so you're absolutely most welcome to, uh, to come. Uh, and if you wish, it would be very, very nice if you uh, would submit a paper uh, to that conference. I also will show you a couple of those references I've been using here. This is this paper, Jean-Bran Le Paul, uh, where uh, this is Bellman uh, equation ID is coming in. Um, this is the paper which uh, looks at uh, those semi-classical equations which associate with the Berman equation. <coughs> um, <coughs> this is the Malbum paper. This is the paper, and this is a very interesting paper really if you're interested in this, uh, where does this uh, mean forward and mean backward derivatives are introduced to uh, develop those uh, Malbum equations, which appear uh, in physical review. And then that's the Hawkins paper on the uh, Lagrangian information, which connects with Malbum equations. And this is the Alinsky uh, approach on curvature and arbitrage. And that's this very beautiful paper, which this, um, gives this connection between the variation of the Lagrangian and the uh, obtaining of those uh, semi-classical equations. 
And then if you are interested in this, we, uh, Andre Emanuel, uh, myself and Andre Kennekov have written a book on this, but I have to tell you right, right away, if you look at the very first page, you'll see right away that we are saying that everything is quantum-like. We're not pretending that anything quantum mechanical is going on at the financial level. So I'm open for questions. <coughs> Yes, this please. is a very informal question. Yeah, sure. Remember that time machine? Yeah. Um, if Jerry and Joyce had been born 150 years earlier and studied um, just order effects and found that the mathematics of rotating bases fitted very well and gave it some name that any word that didn't begin with Q, yeah. and then 100 years later, Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg were born and said, those <coughs> equations are cool. Let's us use them and stuff. Would the philosophy of science issues be exactly the same, or would these debates take a different form? Well, that's the order problem. That that's the order problem. It's an informal question, but also a very difficult one for me to answer. Um, I, would, I really, <laughs> really I'm sorry, but I really don't. I would have to really, really think on, on, on I, I, I don't know. Would, you, would your thoughts on, on the, would, would your views towards these questions be different? Um, probably not, because I was actually attracted in to, to what, what it, my, my, I'm, I'm just like a little fly who's attracted to something very specific in this, and that's the semi-classicality. I'm not interested, really frankly, too much at all in what the quantum stuff may be, but semi-classicality is not really quantum If equations are useful in my field, does it matter whether some other field came on those equations before me or after me? It, what I think is extremely important is that you always mention from where it comes. No, no, that's fine. That's, right, that's would it be less appropriate? No. For, okay. No. No, because I'm not far enough in this development of quantum mechanics to kind of give you a more, a more religious type of answer. <laughs> So, Emmanuel, so you like this Bohmian approach where you have this... Yeah, uh, so may I just interrupt you? I mean, for those who don't know, Bohmian approach in, in physics is not popular. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so for people who have not heard of it, it's, it's not popular, I mean, because it doesn't really add much more to the understanding. Of well, but, but you like it, and you like okay. it because it's got a, a definite path, and then it's got an information wave. Yeah. And so when you apply it to economics, I mean, so yeah, so, Bo so Bohm would think about, I mean, like if you think about Bohm in terms of physics, he's thinking about a real particle having a real path and a real, there is a real wave, like it's an ontological real wave, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? <laughs> but it's not like, not like, like um, Don was talking about earlier with quantum theory now, maybe uh, Fuchs and Caves and these people are thinking about the, the quantum wave just being yeah. A posterior distribution, or prior beliefs, distribution, yeah, before, yeah, yeah. you know, you make you make your predictions. But you're thinking, if you apply this quantum wave idea to economics, finance, what is this wave then? What is this wave? The, the, I mean, the, the, is it a physical thing, or is it just a predictive thing? Or <coughs> how are you interpreting this wave? It's the interpretation here at this point, really, at, as we speak, for me personally, is looking really at the amplitude of it and how the amplitude can as the definition of the quantum potential, how that can actually be used if you put the gradients on the quantum potential, what you can do with this in terms of, of pricing, and uh, the development but of like, pricing rules. Like this wave but that's a level of the amplitude. This point. wave would be like allowing, I mean, so this wave is a, it's a wave, it's a, it's a, it's, what's the, what's the space we're spread across this wave, in this financial wave? So that would be. Yeah. But you would have, you don't, so, but and then you have, if you had a, like a, a change in this, some place in this space that you had this financial wave, that it, it would immediately Yeah, I know, I know, I know, and I, <laughs> you're getting, you're getting nasty here, because of course, we, I know, <laughs> sure, that, there are shortcomings, that, that's definitely a shortcoming. But again, uh, let's not forget, this is, I'm, I'm only claiming this is quantum-like here, I'm not trying, you know, I, I, that's why yeah. I, I talk so about those modeling things. Those so, modeling so you things don't think of the wave as real. I mean, you just think of the wave as some kind of statistical tool. I think so. Yeah. 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 So, so I was curious about something that went by very quickly. So you had this one line about using fiber bundles to model um, 
arbitrage, and presumably the connection there is arbitrage is a path dependence and holonomy is sort of math that you can use to model yeah. path dependence. Yeah. Move order, move order. So, sorry, I, I, I was just uh, saying what was already implicit there that uh, arbitrage is about path dependence and holonomy uh, on fiber bundles is, is sort of good mathematics for modeling path dependence. And I guess I was wondering how much of all of this quantum stuff is really basically just that insight. So you go to fiber bundles with holonomy so that you have path dependence, and then you do some equations on them, right? And yeah. it happens to kind of code. Yes, yeah, no, no, look, I mean, exactly. I, I don't want to say more. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying, I, I have to be honest with you, I'm not trying to, to find more depth in it than, than what you just said. So we could replace quantum like with path that's, uh, that's going back to what uh, I think Mark was saying. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So I, I have to say it in this way because other, otherwise, I mean, uh, that, that's, that's what I'm doing at this, at this point. Yeah. There may be more deeper issues involved, but I certainly don't know. Other comments, questions? One comment uh, <coughs> you referred uh, once, and I, I would like you to take your references there and yeah. send them to Janet. So yeah, no, 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 that's what I was planning to do, but I, okay. I, I, I did mention in talk also, I just want to make sure it's okay to do that because sure, maybe sure, you will absolutely. say, well. A uh, second thing is, is that. You referred to Lyons and uh, Lassery. Yeah. Uh, and you talked about how they uh, were looking at the variational type aspects of the Bellman equation. And uh, they're from the inst uh, they're from a math economics department in Paris 9. And they have shown beautiful, beautiful relationships between some of these variational type of approaches. Yeah. Uh, Lyons, Lassery, uh, 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 several of them, the whole group there. Yeah. Uh, between mathematical physics and mathematical uh, finance and economics. They're really historic. Yeah, they're, they're yeah, really good people. Yeah, Leon's, got, Leon's got the uh, Fields Medal, yeah. which is the mathematical equivalent that yeah. some people see yeah. of uh, yeah. Nobel yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. in years back. Yeah. Yeah. Any other last comments, questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>